is going to score more points this year? Tennessee baseball or Tennessee football? <laughs> Tennessee football is going to score more points this year. That sounds like a competitor's answer. Dang right. Hello, welcome in. Today is the Tuesday, August 16th edition of Always College Football. We appreciate you being with us from wherever it is you're getting us from. That's the ESPN YouTube channel, or if you're joining us via podcast on Apple Podcast or on Spotify, we really appreciate it. If you would like, rate, and subscribe, it helps us out. It helps the show out, and we're trying to tailor the content to your wishes. So just tell us how we can get better there in ESPN's YouTube comment section. Great game plan in store for you today, as we are going to have a great visit with the head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers. He is Josh Heupel. We'll talk about what the Volunteers might look like and where they are in year number two compared to where they were last year. The expectations were low. They far surpassed those expectations. So we'll have a great visit with him. And we're going to give you what we've talked about the last couple days. We're going to hit an AP poll note of the day. So every day you tune in, you're going to get an AP poll takeaway. Does that sound like a fair enough point? All right, cool. We'll get to it. But before we do, let's talk about it with head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers, Josh Heifel. So happy to be joined by the head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers. I thought he legitimately deserved coach of the year recognition last year with what he inherited versus where we're at today. What job you did last year, coach. Uh, he's Josh Heupel and he, he joins Always College Football. So coach, let me just go back to last year. When you took over, when you took over, what was your initial impression of the task that was sitting right in front of you? Yeah, uh, we had a, a long journey uh, to, to get where we, uh, where we still are trying to get. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it was one where you, you, uh, you come into the building. It was unique in the timing of which we took over. They had already started the, the second semester. And so I got a chance to, to see the kids kind of in action in the weight room and, and some of the things that were going on inside the building. But, um, you know, hire a great staff, uh, guys that have uh, the same type of core beliefs and characteristics that, uh, that you want inside of your program. And then just start, you know, that that process and journey of developing relationships with your players and then developing them as players, too. And, and uh, you know, from a, accountability and, and trust inside of the building to the effort and strain that you have to have, the way we attack every day, uh, just, you know, try to build that. And, uh, you know, where we're at today and, and where we started, man, it's been a, a great journey up until this point. We've climbed really quickly. Uh, we still got a long ways to go, but. Uh, we've gotten to the point where uh, we love and I love being in the building with the guys. They're, they're coachable. They love one another and uh, they got great energy every day. Yeah, we're a couple weeks from kickoff and, and we're going to get to this year's roster, this year's team and and the excitement that surrounds the program and the interesting changes that you've made to the program. But uh, I, I can't help but look back to, to the time that we spent with y'all last year and it was so close. It was a great season, but it was so close to being an exemplary season. Yeah. Uh, what's been the message to the guys? Because there were some games where there were some self-inflicted mistakes that let you out on the losing end. And those things could easily have flipped in a heartbeat. So what's been the message to the guys to make sure that, hey, let's not make those mistakes. Let's not shoot ourselves in the foot. Let's take care of business in crucial moments to make sure that in year number two, those mistakes that we made last year are a thing of the past. Yeah. You know, uh, when when you look back at last year, um, and during the course of the season, I, I think part of that is why we created buy-in, too. We were able to show the players, man, here's things that we did that affected and changed the way the game was played and the reason the outcome happened. It wasn't, you know, some major issue. It was the little details in, in how we function, how we operate, how we compete, and being a smarter football team. And uh, that created buy-in. I, I think that's why you look at each quarter of the season. Um, I thought we got better every single quarter and played our best football at the, at the end of the year. Um, you know, the off season, there were a lot of near misses, uh, you know, games, four or five games in the fourth quarter, we had an opportunity to win that we didn't. And uh, being able to reset this off season, go back to uh, the process that you have to go through the journey that it is, uh, the attention to detail a year uh, more in our, our strength and conditioning program, physically changing our bodies between that and nutrition, uh, the accountability in how you do anything, how you do everything uh, from class uh, to your social life, to your sleep habits, to how you're uh, functioning and operating inside of the building. We've been very purposeful, very intentional in everything that we've done. We've 
you know, we built a lot of uh, connection last year. This year's been about uh, creating a bunch of leadership and, and having them have the ability to communicate. You've been around this game long enough to know, um, you know, the coaches and their expectations matter. Championship seasons happen because there's accountability and championship level uh, of uh, leadership inside of the locker room. And, and uh, we've started to take that journey. Uh, I, I love what uh, our, our uh, leadership council has done. Uh, the ownership, the buy-in. Uh, you go out to the practice field with us now. Uh, sometimes as coaches, it's hard to get a word in uh, because there's typically somebody on the sideline that's already talking and communicating with that guy and uh, and coaching him up, which is exact, exactly the way that we want it here. And, and uh, so uh, we've we've paid that price through you know the early part of this uh, this off season. Uh, we got to finish training camp uh, the right way and, and put ourselves in position to have a great season. Well, the good news is, it's like some of the mistakes, coach, it's like, you know, a drop shallow cross against Florida, you know, a long foul ball against Bowling Green or Pitt. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like the most correctable things. It's like, it's not like, hey, you know, we couldn't block them. It's like, hey, we dropped the pass. Like, all right. I feel pretty good about making those plays here in year number two. Uh, you talk about the excitement around the program. We can all feel it. Like, I, I'll be the first one to admit, like, yeah, I know I went to Alabama, but I root for Tennessee. I want Tennessee to do well. I want Tennessee because they're a traditional power. Uh, I want Tennessee to be in the mix. You went to Oklahoma. You want Oklahoma probably, even though you don't work there anymore, but you want them to be there. Like You acknowledge the historical significance when great programs are great again. It's good for the sport. So what were your impressions of Tennessee football over the last decade compared to what your impressions are now, having been in Knoxville the better part of the last 18 months? Yeah, having been in this league before, seen it up close and personal, been in, being in the same division with them for a couple of years, and obviously paying attention to it just as a fan of, of college football. Iconic brand that uh, has all the tools and resources to, to be in the upper echelon of college football and have an opportunity to compete for championships year in and year out. Uh, where it resides, the footprint that we have, the ability to recruit at a, a really high and elite level and a brand that allows you to go national uh, at times as well. And um, to me, and in, in some of this stems from from my playing days, you know, I went to Oklahoma when they hadn't been to a bowl game for five straight years. That's not what I stepped to when I came here to Tennessee. Uh, but there had been some some ups and downs. And to me, when you have the right leadership, it was important for me in the in the process to make sure that that leadership had a cohesive vision uh, of where they wanted this program to go. Um, and then you're able to hire great people. And, and uh, so, um, you know, I view this as uh, a unique opportunity to take over an iconic brand, uh, put a new age approach on the great traditions uh, and history of that uh, program uh, and to be able to do it your own way, but also have everything that you need uh, to recruit and, and compete at the highest levels. As good as I thought it was on the outside, uh, it's even better on the inside. And uh, the fan base is passionate. They care. They care every minute of every day. Um, you know, Knoxville to me is one of the coolest college cities in, in all of college sports. It is an unbelievable place to live. Uh, it's big enough that you got personal and professional development opportunities for your players. Uh, at the same time, everything bleeds orange and white. It is a, a really great place to live. You ever get nervous about your players having to walk to class because it's so hilly and mountainous? Like they get tired <laughs> walking to class. You ever get worried about that? Uh, you know, we're at the bottom of the hill uh, right here by the river with our, our football facility, the dorm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a quick climb from the from the dorm. Uh, we've made sure that they're getting to class, though, Greg. Oh, I believe it. Now, I remember when, on my visit there, I was like, golly, I, this is this is the most beautiful. It's so beautiful, but God, I'm exhausted. I better get in shape if I want to play here. I remember that being a big part of it. Uh, you talked about the new style approach and your offense. Um, I'm trying to figure out when the genesis of this offense really took place, because at Missouri... I don't feel like you were as tempo as you are now. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm just, maybe I'm misremembering it. At your previous destinations prior to Missouri, I don't remember it being quite as high octane. UCF, of course it was. But where did this insane tempo really begin for you as you started to develop this philosophy? Yeah, we did. We, did. Uh, we played different uh, at Missouri. And, and, uh, and I say that meaning that our personnel uh, was different there uh, than it has been You know, everywhere I've been since then. Um, you know, some of the wide splits we started messing with when I was at Oklahoma. Uh, we played with a ton of tempo early in my tenure at, at Oklahoma. Uh, we had actually, uh, the, 
you know, dating back to that, uh, we played uh, West Virginia and Fiesta Bowl, um, and uh, uh, they were a no huddle at that time with uh, with Rich Rod, and and uh, we incorporated that the following season. Had great uh, experience with it. Um, got away from it on the back end just because philosophically that's what the head coach wanted to do. Um, you know, since Missouri and UCF, we've continued to build upon our our tempo. You know, schematically, you always change. You know this. It, it fluctuates from year to year. You know, you, you start everything with, you know, your personnel or you got two tight ends that you want to play with. You got three. You got uh, four wideouts that you want to play in. And then uh, you put those kids in a position and, and uh, you make sure that you're putting your offensive line in a position to, to be successful in uh, in the run game and in pass pro, too. And, and certainly uh, it comes down to what your quarterback can highly function with and, and control the game with. And, and uh, so you, you subtly change, but uh, the tempo is a huge part of how we apply pressure to defenses. Uh, I just don't know how you see it. Cause I remember calling, we did two of your games last year. One in particular against Alabama stood out to me. Cause that's obviously a very, very good defense, top 10 defense or whatever. And I'm watching y'all and all, all of a sudden the safety is just the tiniest bit outside leverage. Boom, you hit a post over the middle. They tackle them inside the 20. Then, boom, they line up the next play. They're outside leverage again. Boom, you hit the post for a touchdown. Like, How do you see it so quickly and relay it to your quarterback so quickly? I think, you know, we got a, a great offensive staff, starting with our offense coordinator, Alex Golish, his ability to see things up in the box, communicate it. Our quarterback's coach is up there as well. Uh, we have a staff uh, that really offensively has been together for uh, a long period of time. Our offensive line coach, uh, dates back. We've been. This is our seventh year together, dating all the way back to to our days in in Columbia. Um, you know, so we got a clear vision of how we want to play because of all the different things that we've seen. Uh, some of that going in, and and you've game planned for, or and a lot of it has been, you know, things that we haven't game planned for and had to adjust during the course of the ball game too. Uh, we have the ability to to adjust really quickly. Our quarterback is extremely bright, extremely smart. He understands the reason why we're doing the things on, on offense. And, and when something is called, he has a pretty good idea of why we are making that call. And um, there's a lot more that goes into it uh, that, that people can't see within our tempo. Uh, Hendon Hooker does a great job of controlling everything uh, that we do at the line of scrimmage. Well, now that Hendon's in year two in the system and uh, you would imagine, I would imagine his comfort levels just you know, skyrocketed his confidence level skyrocketed last year. I mean, no one really knew what he was. And then sure enough, it's like, bang, bang. it's like, golly, this guy can go, you know? So now yeah. like, what do you see different in him this year as compared to where he was a year ago? Yeah. For, first, it just starts with his complete command of, of our football team and, and ownership and leadership and, you know, true uh, belief in, in his ability to lead and communicate and uh, his energy inside the building so different than it was this time uh, a year ago. And certainly when we first got here, uh, he's continued to grow in his confidence uh, because of the work that he's put in offensively, just dramatically different, uh, even from where we ended the season last year. He's got great command of, of what we're doing, gets us out of bad plays, gets us into to really solid plays and, and uh has the ability to extend and make plays, um, you know, from protections to our run schemes to, to what we're doing down the field. Uh, he's got complete ownership and command of what we're doing. And and you know that, you know, each year you have a chance to make that jump as a quarterback. He he really, with his offseason habits, has made a huge jump fundamentally inside of the pocket, ability to find, the, you know, the soft spot in the pocket and be able to deliver the football down the field. Certainly when we, uh, we get to, to live game days, uh, his ability to to get out of the pocket and make plays with his feet is a big part of our success too. When, when you look last year, Coach, and I know you're so proud of the weapons on the outside with with the young guys coming along and obviously Tillman turning into a superstar with what Brew McCoy might add as an additional piece. I know you got weapons, but the one thing I feel like in, in watching y'all last year, the one area that I wanted to see y'all do a little bit better is run in predictable situations, third and short, goal line, exact, you know, et cetera. It was just not something that you guys did real well last year. So what emphasis have you put on that to make sure that that's not something that reveals its ugly head like it did down the stretch at times in the final half of the season last yeah. year? Yeah, for sure. There, there's uh, some short yardage situations that, that we got to be better in on the offensive side of the football. And, and uh, you know, I and, and our staff and players understand that, too. And, and uh, you know, some of that's just fundamentals and technique. You know, that they're going to have to line up and block those guys in, in some of those situations. And, and we can be better in that. And that's, 
you know, from strength and conditioning to, to understand the fundamentals and technique, why you go out to the practice field every single day. Uh, some of it can be scheme too, and, and how we uh, put our kids in, in the best position to be successful too. So uh, you got to put all those things together uh, for us to go out and function and operate at a, at a higher level than we did a year ago. You know, earlier in the program, you talked about, you know, drop balls. You know, those are all things that our players can grow in. And, and uh, the short yard situations are important to us, man. In, in this league, you got to find a way to get to the next set of downs. Uh, we're going to play elite defensive lines. we got to be able to line up and, and put our hand in the dirt and go block those guys. And, uh, um, you know, it's going to be critical inside of the red zone, too. you got to get seven instead of kicking for three. I'll tell you what, man, those those uh, short yardage I – I didn't play a lot of Big Ten game. I didn't play a lot of Big 12 or anything, but I know – Short yardage was the worst. Like, I hate short yardage. It was a freaking war for those six inches, but it was what it was. Of course, I always wanted to call QB sneak too. It was awful. I hated quarterback sneaks and short yardage. But Yeah, it sounds and feels a little bit different in those short yardage <laughs> situations in this league than it does in some of the others. Like it is promise. not fun. Uh, I want to talk briefly about your defense. It, it feels like just – I've been comparing you all a little bit all offseason to Ole Miss last year, and I say that as a glowing compliment because I believe in your quarterback. I believe in your offensive system. I think you're close, so close to doing something really special. Ole Miss last year goes to the Sugar Bowl, 10-win season, remarkable, remarkable year. All they needed from year one or from 2020 to 2021 was just slight improvement on the defensive side. So I know you're going to have more depth. I know you feel good about some of the guys that come back on that side of the ball. Got to replace a couple pieces in the secondary. But how do you plan on, on helping this defense be better from start to finish so they're not having to play as many defensive snaps as at times you had to play last year? Yeah, a long term, uh, uh, playing just slightly better defense or average defense isn't isn't the standard here, man. Right. <laughs> There's this is the land of great defenses and and great defensive players too. And as we continue to add uh, add players to our roster and, and develop the ones that are here, I, I know that uh, with Coach Banks and our defense staff, we're going to play elite defense. There's no question in my mind. Um, you know, last year. Uh, you know, I didn't talk about it very often, but, you know, we had 69 scholarship yeah. players. You look at, I think it was 27 guys that left uh, before we got here in the transfer portal. I think 24 or 25 of them were starting somewhere else uh, in college football, most of them in Power Five. There were a lot of good players that left, and, and there were a lot of them that left from the defensive side of the ball that were playing at, at other places. And, and um, you know, for us, we weren't as deep as we needed to be. Our kids understand that we've tried to develop that. They got to still go earn it here on the back half of training camp and in the early part of the season. But uh, we're going to need to play more guys. Um, we got to get better at, at affecting the quarterback in, in, in third and long situations. You look at us, you know, I think we led the country in tackles for loss up until maybe the last week of the season. Uh, we were in a bunch of third and long situations where if you're going to play defensive football, that's where you want to be. We got to get off the field, and and uh, that can be with your, your secondary being better in, in your coverages. Some of that's you know understanding your scheme and in, in year two in the system, but we also got to be better at, at affecting the quarterback. Coach Garner uh, does a great job with our defensive line. Uh, we've gotten better. We've developed there. Um, we've added pieces. We got some young guys in this program that that got to grow here quickly uh, before we get to kickoff. Uh, that are going to have to help us in those situations to to go get the quarterback. Um, and uh, long term, um, I, I really feel strongly about who we have in the building and, and our ability to go play elite defense. Yeah, you, could, you could definitely disrupt last year, though, at the line of scrimmage. Like you said, it forced a lot of negative plays just getting yeah. off the field on third down, I know, uh, is a huge point of emphasis for y'all. I, I want to quickly ask you about what's going on bigger picture in the program with the changes that are coming to Neyland, some of the commitment from your administration to the football program, the support that you're getting from your NIL collective and everything else. You know, where is Tennessee right now compared to, say, where it was a year ago as far as just the support that you're getting from everyone outside the building? Yeah, the excitement, the energy, Knoxville, the state of Tennessee, Vol Nation across the country. Uh, it's such an exciting time to, to be a part of of the Tennessee uh, athletic department. Um, and I say that because you look at everything that's going on, basketball, baseball, the success that we've had, it's, it's a really cool uh, time where our brand's in front of everybody for 365 days out of the year. On the football side of it, man, we got a $35 million renovation to our current athletic uh, facility here uh, for football. We got a $100 million project that's finishing up inside of Neyland, be ready for kickoff. Uh, got a, you know, close to a $200 million project the following year as well uh, in renovations on, on Neyland. So there's so many po positive things that are happening here. 
that's had a huge impact on, on our ability to recruit. Uh, you combine that with the brand of football that we play and the culture that we have in the building. Uh, it's been a huge part of our recruiting success. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's very exciting where you guys are at. And we'll get you out of here with this. We always ask kind of a fun question at the end. Uh, it's, mine's a little bit of a two part question. Is that reasonable? You good with that? Yeah, uh, potentially. We'll see what the first and second part is. <laughs> All right. Who is going to score more points this year? Tennessee baseball or Tennessee football? <laughs> Tennessee football is going to score more points this year, but uh, I expect uh, the ball to be pounded out of the yard when we get to spring in in baseball season too. Oh, they say, if we want to go flash back to the to, to this past spring, if we're going to go twenty twenty two, you guys might have to jump pretty high to get over that hurdle that they've already set for you. And then finally, who is a more intense competitor, you or Tony Vitella? Not even close. I am. Uh, Tony is is uh, a fierce competitor for sure, but uh, he's a close second. That sounds like a competitor's answer. That's the way I see it. Dang I right. <laughs> All right. Coach Heupel, man, we appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Best of luck this year. We can't wait to watch your Vols here in your number two. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Have a great day. All right, what a great visit with head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers, Josh Heupel. Man, what a job he did last year. I mean, just ridiculous. To take over a completely decimated roster, adding pieces via the portal, creating an identity. I remember sitting there at SEC Media Days in 2021 saying, if Tennessee can create an identity offensively and get to a bowl game, that would be a huge success in year number one. Well, we obviously know that they've done just that. Sky's the limit for what they could be this year. Very excited for them. And more specifically, very excited for their fans. All right. The AP poll takeaway of the day. Being number one is not exactly where you want to be, at least in this century. Since 2000, there have been only two teams that started at number one overall in the preseason that went on to win the national championship. That was 2004 USC and 2017 Alabama. So Alabama carries the crown right now. Will they be able to buck the trend like they did five years ago? We will find out. For all of us here at Always College Football, we really appreciate you being with us. Thanks to Josh Heupel. Very generous with his time here during what is a very busy and important fall camp for the volunteers. Thanks to Mark Kubiak, who's having him me at his house. He's right over there. Yeah, he's right over there. And we uh, are having a great time together here in Charlotte. So we appreciate the time that we've been able to spend together. And thanks to all of you. Please like, rate, and subscribe on the ESPN YouTube channel, or if it's on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, it really helps us out. It really helps out the show. So we really appreciate the interaction. Hit us up in our email at alwayscollegefootball at gmail.com. Hit us up on social media at alwayscfb. That's on Instagram and on Twitter. For Mark Kubiak, I'm Greg McElroy. Hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.